So thinking back to our discussion on Tuesday, we finished up working through the three parts of the brainstem. We talked about the medulla first. Um, then we talked about the pons, which sits just above the medulla. And then the last thing we talked about was the midbrain. And if we look back on that very first page to this image, those are these three structures here. The next thing that I'm going to talk about is actually not something that you can pinpoint out on this figure. Okay? And that is what we call the reticular formation. Okay? It's not like a singular structure. Instead, it's a small cluster of gray matter kind of interspersed or sprinkled in within the white matter of our brain stem, but also certain regions of the spinal cord, the diencephalon, and even the cerebellum. So it's just kind of gray matter in this general area, as well as up in here and back into the cerebellum as well. Um, you can see it's kind of shaded here in purple. Um, and uh, as you can see, there's arrows kind of pointing all over the place within the brain. Okay? And uh, well, the main part of the reticular formation I want to talk about is what we call the reticular activating system. This consists of sensory axons that project to the cerebral cortex, which is the very outer part of the cerebrum. We'll talk about that later this morning. Um, and uh, the reticular activating system, or RES for short, does quite a bit of different stuff. Possibly its most important function is what we call consciousness, which is defined as a state of wakefulness in which an individual is fully alert, aware, and oriented. So, you know, not being asleep, obviously. Speaking of sleep, though, if you inactivate the RAS, it is what causes sleep. Sleep is defined as a state of partial consciousness from in which an individual can be aroused. Arousal is um, just another way to say uh, that you're waking up from sleep, and the RAS is involved with that. Okay, if you, you uh, essentially um, inactivate the RAS, you go to sleep. If you activate the RAS, you awaken. Okay? Um, sleep and a coma are fairly similar. Um, a coma is defined as a state of unconsciousness from which an individual cannot be aroused. So you can't, you know, slap them in the face, wake them up, toss some water in their face, scream really loud, they're not going to wake up. Okay, whereas sleep is uh, partial consciousness and you can be aroused. Comas can happen when the RAS is damaged and uh, hopefully nothing somebody ever experiences. Uh, it's, it's not a good thing. So, all right, other things that the RAS is responsible for helps maintain attention, which is like being able to concentrate on a single object or thought. So in other words, hopefully you guys are, you know, maintaining attention, listening to me and not thinking about what's going on in your life or something else. And then alertness. Uh, it prevents sensory overload by filtering out unimportant sensory information. So like if there's like, you know, noise coming from outside the room. Um, in uh, Highland, when I teach this, um, there's a lot of times a vehicle or um, in some cases tractors drive by because the classroom I teach in um, is the main strip there in Highland. And uh, there's a lot of traffic, despite Highland being a small town down that road. Um, Hopefully, as I'm teaching, students are able to filter out that unimportant noise and stuff from outside the classroom. Uh, I always joke that for whatever reason, it seems like guys have their ability to filter out sensory information on overload. And that's why uh, when our wives or girlfriends tell us something that we don't actually hear, them, my wife would definitely agree with that sentiment. Uh, the RS also helps with maintaining what we call muscular tone. So muscular tone is a slight degree of involuntary contraction um, when our uh, muscles are in a normal resting state. So even though our muscles might feel like they're relaxed, like if you're laying down or just sitting around, truly they're not because there is this muscular tone going on in there. As far as the image goes, I'm not really worried about it. It's just kind of um, one from the textbook demonstrating uh, the reticular formation. But that's something I'm going to ask you label for the exam. Okay, moving on to the cerebellum, our largest part of the hindbrain and overall the second largest part of our brain. And as you can see, there's a lot going on here. And uh, we'll talk about it all once you guys get the blanks filled in. 
just those two. Oh, there's one over there. Sorry. There's one somewhere. All right. Once again, it's important that you don't confuse the cerebrum and the cerebellum. Their names are very similar. Um, aside from their names being similar, there's also a lot of similarities between the two. We haven't talked about the cerebrum too much yet, but like the cerebrum, the cerebellum has a highly folded surface uh, that greatly increases the surface area of its outer gray matter cortex, allowing for a greater number of neurons. So both the cerebrum and the cerebellum, if you look at them, whether that's here or on this page, okay, it's folded. There are these indentations, both in the cerebrum and the cerebellum. Hey, the cerebellar um, indentations are quite a bit smaller, whereas like the folds here in the cerebrum are a little bit bigger. That just increases surface area, and we've seen that phrase before, uh, and essentially just means that there's more neurons, okay? and so there's more brain power in these regions. Okay? Uh, even though your cerebellum only consists of a tenth of the brain's overall mass, it contains nearly half of the neurons in our brain, so a very significant number. Okay? Location is posterior to the medulla and the pons. It's inferior to the posterior portion of the cerebrum. A deep groove known as the transverse fissure, along with the tentorium cerebelli, separates the cerebellum from the, the cerebrum. We talked about that tentorium cerebelli the other day. That's an extension of the uh, uh, dura mater. If you look down here at the bottom, uh, we've zoomed in at the cerebellum. Here you can see the pons, the uh, medulla, there's the midbrain up here would be the cerebrum, but the picture's been kind of cut off at that point. Here's uh, just a real deal version of that. Okay, um, you can kind of see where the mid or excuse me, the, the cerebellum is cut off from what would be above, and that would be the, the cerebrum. I pointed out that transverse fissure. Actually, I can just use this picture, just this kind of indentation or notch right there between the, the cerebellum and the cerebrum. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Two lobes or two excuse me, hemispheres make up the cerebrum, uh, what we call the right and left hemispheres. Uh, we call them cerebellar hemispheres, but if you're referring to the cerebrum, we'd call them cerebral hemispheres, so don't confuse those. Uh, basically, they're just the two halves. Uh, and in the case of the cerebellum, they're connected by a narrow bridge called the vermis. And uh, it kind of looks like a little worm, and actually, I believe that's what the word vermis means. Uh, we can see it here in our superior and our inferior images, and then that gives us a good view of those two hemispheres and the two halves. Um, as we'll find out here in a little bit, um, the cerebrum is made up of lobes, and actually, I labeled those on the uh, the first page in that picture. Okay, the same situation is here in the cerebellum. So each hemisphere is going to consist of lobes separated by deep and distinct fissures. There are um, two of each of these, so one for each hemisphere. The anterior and the posterior <laughs> lobes of the cerebellum are going to govern subconscious aspects of our skeletal muscle movements. So in other words, controlling muscle movements that we aren't like consciously thinking about. I can never pronounce this lobe, so I was just called the F lobe. It's on the inferior surface and it contributes to equilibrium and balance. And if you look at these two images, we can see anterior and posterior lobes in our superior view. And then if you flip it, look from uh, beneath, you can see that F lobe that I mentioned. And then you can also see the posterior lobe. And once again, there's one of these lobes in each of the two hemispheres. So there's posterior lobe here, posterior lobe here, anterior lobe, anterior lobe, F lobe here, F lobe there. And uh, the cerebellum has a surface cortex of gray matter known as what we call the cerebellar cortex, found in a series of folds known as folia. So uh, when we talk about the cortex of the brain, like what we were talking about here on this previous page, typically what you're going to be thinking about is the cerebral cortex. That's the really highly advanced part of our brain, but your cerebellum also has a cortex. It's just a very thin outer part of both the cerebrum and the cerebellum. If we're talking the cerebellum, it'd be cerebellar cortex. And it's made up of gray matter. So it's not going to be those myelinated axons. Okay. Um, the folds of that gray matter are known as folia. Okay. And you can see those are shown down here in the picture and labeled as such. Deep to that gray matter, which is on the outside, 
is a selection of white matter. And I labeled it back on that first page, what we call the Arbor Vitae or Arbor Vitae, uh, which translates to mean tree of life. Okay? And uh, that's because, and you can really see it here in this image where the cadaver has been cut open, the white looks like little tree branches, okay? And if you think about the word folia, it sounds a lot like foliage. If you don't know what foliage is, it refers to like leaves on a tree. Okay? And that's what grows on the branches, right? So that's where those terms are coming from. The folia is the gray matter. That's like the, the leaves growing off of the white branches here, which is the arbor vitae, the, the tree of life. There are also four additional masses of gray matter found deep to the arbor vitae. We call them deep cerebellar nuclei, and they give rise to axons carrying impulses from the cerebellum to other brain centers. Uh, if you were to look to find them, it would be kind of right in here, but they're not visible or labeled um, in the image. Cerebellum also is connected to the brain stem via three pairs of what we call cerebellar peduncles, which you can see those are labeled here in that. Um, uh, inferior view. Uh, they're just going to be bundles of white matter consisting of axons conducting impulses between the cerebellum and other parts of the brain and to help coordinate movement and regulate posture balance. Those three cerebellar peduncles are the superior, the middle, and the inferior. Given a lot of information off on those, especially the inferior, um, and it's really technical stuff that I'm really not that worried about you knowing for the exam, so I'm not even going to read through it. Uh, so those are the kind of structural makeups of, or that's the structural, structural makeup of the cerebellum. What does it do? I've already kind of mentioned it does different things for posture and balance and skeletal muscle movements. So this last bullet just describes that primary function is to evaluate how, move, how well movements initiated by the motor areas in the cerebrum are actually being carried out. So basically uh, your cerebellum is not responsible for initiating most skeletal muscle movements. Like when you write your notes, when you get up and walk across the room, when you throw a ball, those signals are originating in the cerebrum. But your cerebellum is making sure that those signals are being carried out correctly. So it makes sure that the motion is being um, taken care of the correct way. And in doing so, that's what's going to help smooth um, and coordinate skeletal muscle contractions. So once again, signal does not originate in the, the cerebellum for muscle contraction, but it makes sure it's getting done correctly. Um, and in doing so, that also helps with regulating things like posture and balance. So you're staying upright and you're not tipping over. Um, and they even believe that the cerebellum may have roles in cognition and language processing. So obviously not like motor type activities, but more of um, complex cognitive things. As far as the images, I'm not really too worried about figure A or B, although I kind of pointed some stuff out. The image that I do want you to know is figure C. And if you think about it, it's just, you know, back to this first picture, just zoomed in at this segment of the bigger image so we can kind of see some of those more intricate things. Uh, what I want you to highlight in this image um, includes the following. I'm just going to kind of focus in on the stuff associated with the, the cerebellum, not any of the stuff um, that's visible out there that we've talked about already or will talk about. Um, so here's what you need to highlight. I do want you to highlight the fourth ventricle since it's that chamber between the cerebellum and the pons. Um, I want you to highlight the arbor vitae, the folia, and the cerebellar cortex. So nothing too crazy as far as the image goes, but I. Uh, do want you to know those things. All right, moving up from the back of the brain, we're going to now move into what we call the diencephalon. The diencephalon, once again, is made up of things like the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. Okay, we'll finish up with the, the rest of the structures on the next slide. For this slide, we're just going to talk about strictly the thalamus. Okay. Each side of your brain has a thalamus, and the thalamus, um, each of them are a pair, uh, or a pair of oval masses of gray matter uh, perched at the superior end of the brain stem beneath the cerebral hemispheres. Its nickname, and this is something I would definitely want you to know, is the gateway to the cerebral cortex, which I'll explain why. It's the very first bullet down there under the functions. Okay. 
Uh, first, let's talk about anatomical features of it. A uh, bridge of gray matter called the interthalamic adhesion joins the right and left halves of the thalamus, but not in everybody, only about 70% of human brains. Remember, inter means between, so uh, between the thalamus, and it is just basically, if you look at this image here, where we're looking at the medial view, just this little white dot there. Um, and then if you look down here, where you're kind of looking above and from the side, here you are the two halves, and then there's that interthalamic adhesion. Um, a vertical Y-shaped sheet of white matter called the internal medullary lamina divides the gray matter of the right and left sides. It's going to be made up of myelinated axons that enter and leave various thalamic nuclei. Um, you can see that's actually labeled right here as well as uh, um, right there in the image down there at the bottom are two images. Axons that connect the thalamus and the cerebral cortex pass through what we'll call the internal capsule, which is a band of white matter lateral to the thalamus. Uh, internal capsule is labeled somewhere, I believe. I thought I saw it. Maybe it's there. Oh, well, not a big deal. Um, based on their positions and functions, there are seven major groups of nuclei on each side of the thalamus, and that's why you see all these different colors. Okay. Those seven nuclei are the anterior nucleus, the medial nuclei, the lateral group, the ventral group, the intralaminar nuclei, midline nucleus, and reticular nucleus. Now, as far as these images, do you need to know them and identify the nuclei or anything? Really, no. Okay, I'm not going to put any of those images on the exam. Basically, all you really need to know is like, you know, that these parts are a component of the thalamus. So know that there are seven nuclei. I'm not going to ask you to know their specific names, but you know I might ask on the exam which um, structure of the brain has an anterior nucleus, da 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 da, and you just would have to say the thalamus. Okay, does that make sense? So it could be a lot worse, I promise you, but it's not going to be. Uh, what you want to do definitely as well know though is what it does. First of all, I'll talk about why we call it the gateway to the cerebral cortex. It is the major relay station for most sensory impulses that reach the primary sensory areas of the cerebral cortex from our spinal cord and our brain stem. So in other words, basically when you are itchy or when you're hot, when you're cold, when you um, feel pain or pressure, a lot of times, it's not always, but for most sensory signals that are traveling up to your brain, up to into what we call the cerebral cortex, those signals coming up and into the brain first take a stop in the thalamus before they then travel out to that cerebral cortex. So that's why it's the gateway. It has to travel through the thalamus in most cases. Not always, but most sensory impulses do. Okay. So it's obviously very involved with sensory stuff. It's also going to be contributing to motor functions by transmitting information from the cerebellum basal ganglia to the primary motor area of the cerebral cortex. It relays nerve impulses between different areas of the cerebrum. It plays a role in the maintenance of consciousness, which we learned about earlier today. And then several groups of nuclei located on the sides of the thalamus, function and emotions, memory, learning, cognition, sensor information, auditory impulses for hearing, visual impulses for sight from the retina, arousal and olfaction, which is just a fancy word for smell. So it does a lot of different things. Really a big thing that it does is sensory stuff. All right, from the thalamus, we will now talk about the other major components of the diencephalon, which includes the hypothalamus. Very, very important structure. And then I'll go ahead and let you guys write out the stuff down there at the bottom. So we got all the blanks filled in and we don't have to worry about doing it later. All right. The hypothalamus forms parts of the walls of the floor of our third ventricle. It, like, that's, 
I should say form parts of the walls and the floor of the third ventricle. So in other words, remember the third ventricle is one of those chambers within our brain. Hypothalamus helps contr uh, to contribute to forming part of that. Um, it is described as a major control center of the autonomic nervous system. That's one of the most important things that our hypothalamus does, but it's not the only thing. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Not only is it very involved with the autonomic nervous system, it's also the major control center of the endocrine or hormonal system. So therefore, we're going to talk about it again in our next unit. It won't be the very next lecture, but we'll talk about it in the endocrine lecture, which is lecture number two in uh, unit five. Structurally, it's composed of a dozen or so nuclei found in four major regions, and that's why we see down here at the bottom those um, four colors, okay? The four regions of the mammillary, the tuberal, the supraoptic, and the preoptic region. Um, let's talk about each of those. Mammillary or posterior hypothalamic area is the most posterior part of the hypothalamus, it includes the mammillary bodies and the posterior hypothalamic nuclei. You can see both of those are... Uh, um, labeled down here at the bottom. Um, the tuberal or intermediate hypothalamic area is the widest part, includes the dorsal medial, ventral medial, and arcuate nuclei, as well as the infundibular stalk, which is a structure that connects the hypothalamus and the pituitary to, um, to one another. We'll talk more about the pituitary uh, when we get to the endocrine system. Uh, the supraoptic or anterior hypothalamic area lies superior to the optic chiasm, which is the point where the two optic nerves crisscross. It also contains what we call the paraventricular, superoptic, anterior, peri periventricular hypothalamic, and the suprachiasmatic nuclei. Preoptic area is the final area. It's anterior to the superoptic area. It contains the medial and lateral preoptic nuclei. As far as identifying and labeling those, absolutely not. I'm not going to worry about you knowing that, nor am I going to worry about you knowing all the different like little nuclei and all those fancy names that it was really hard for me to even pronounce. Okay, what you'll want to just make sure you know is that there are four specific parts to the hypothalamus and what those are, the mammillary, tuberal, supraoptic, and preoptic. So just know that those are the four parts to the Hypothalamus. Okay. Also, want to make sure you know that uh, the hypothalamus does a lot of different things, and those include secreting hormones, and that's why it's the major regulator of your endocrine system. The endocrine system utilizes hormones uh, that alter various body activities. Okay. Now, there's two types of hormones that your hypothalamus produces: those that regulate and control the anterior pituitary gland and those that are released by the posterior pituitary. Okay. We'll get into all this in our uh, next unit, like I said, but hanging down from the hypothalamus is two parts to the pituitary. You can kind of see them very nicely here. You have the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary. Okay. The anterior pituitary is completely separate from the posterior pituitary. Those two structures actually could not be any more different, even though they're connected to one another. Okay. Well, the hypothalamus produces seven hormones that then travel to the anterior pituitary and trigger different things that regulate growth, metabolism, reproduction, and stress responses. We'll get into all that, like I said, in our next unit. Okay. Well, the posterior pituitary and the hypothalamus are actually connected to one another. In fact, the hypothalamus produces two hormones that are then carried from the hypothalamus into the posterior pituitary where they're then actually released. So you can describe the posterior pituitary as just like an extension of the hypothalamus. And uh, we'll get into all that, like I said, here in a, in a, a week or so. Um, we mentioned earlier that the uh, hypothalamus is a major regulator of your autonomic nervous system. Remember the autonomic nervous system is that division that does everything for us automatically, like you know, regulating your heart rate and your blood pressure and all those wonderful things that we don't have to think about. It controls things like heart rate, blood pressure, secretion, and motility of your stomach and intestines, among many other things. It helps regulate all those fancy, fancy things. For those of you who are taking physiology, you know all about that, but uh, we'll just leave it at that for now. You can describe your hypothalamus as being our body's thermostat. It triggers us to shiver and to sweat when we get cold or when we get hot, okay, so that we can uh, maintain a 
hopefully constant body temperature. Uh, all food and water intake is regulated thanks to the hypothalamus. Um, it does so by monitoring your blood glucose or blood sugar, as well as your amino acid levels and makes you hungry if those are low. If those are um, at a satisfactory level, they make you satiated or uh, being satisfied as far as appetite goes. So it makes you not hungry. Um, it also monitors the osmolarity of your blood, which is just kind of a fancy way to describe the water levels in your blood. And if those are low, they can make you thirsty. And then if you're thirsty, you drink more water. That obviously happens when we are dehydrated. The hypothalamus sets your sleep and circadian rhythms, which are uh, kind of very intertwined with one another. Uh, your circadian rhythms, despite what it kind of might sound like, it has nothing to do with like your heart rate. Uh, that's your cardiac rhythms. Okay, circadian rhythms are your biological clock, 24-hour cycle of events that happen every day. One of the most important components of that is your sleep-wake cycle. So, in other words, if you're a morning person or if you're a night owl, um, that is all circadian rhythm stuff, and your hypothalamus is in charge of it. Hypothalamus is also involved with quite a bit of different stuff. It's involved with memory because it lies in the pathway of signals traveling from what's called the hippocampus, which is an important memory center of our brain on the way to the thalamus. And then parts of the hypothalamus we'll talk about here in a couple of slides when we get to the limbic system, which is your emotional brain. Um, so your hypothalamus is involved with emotions as well. Things like anger, aggression, fear, pleasure, contentment, as well as sexual drive and orgasm. Uh, so a lot, a lot, a lot is courtesy of those parts of our hypothalamus. Superior and posterior to the thalamus, here's your thalamus. So kind of in this general area is the epithalamus. Okay. And there's two major parts to the epithalamus, one of which is the pineal gland. That's not labeled, but that's what this little doodad is right here. And that's actually the major structure. The other is a what we call habenular nuclei, which is involved with olfaction and smell, as well as uh, being emotionally uh, respondent to odors, like you know, if you smell something and it triggers an emotion. Let's talk about the pineal gland. That's the major structure, like I said, of the epithalamus. It's a small piece-sized structure protruding from the posterior midline of the third ventricle. It produces a chemical called melatonin. Melatonin sounds a lot like melanin. We talked about melanin earlier in the semester, which gives us our skin pigment, our hair color. Obviously not what we're talking about here. Melatonin is a timekeeping hormone that helps set that biological clock stuff I was talking about earlier, your circadian rhythms. Well, I just said that the hypothalamus sets your sleep and circadian rhythms, but now I'm telling you the pineal gland does. Well, that's because the suprachiasmatic nuclei of the hypothalamus actually control the secretion of melatonin by the pineal gland. So the hypothalamus is in charge. The pineal gland just does the job. It releases the melatonin when it's told to. Okay. And then finally, parts of the diencephalon called circumventricular organs or CVOs. Uh, get their name because they lie in the wall of their ventricle, can monitor chemical changes in the blood because they lack that blood brain barrier that we've talked about. Um, CBOs include parts of the hypothalamus, the pineal gland, the pituitary, and a few nearby structures. Okay, not that that's super important. What do they do though is what I want you to know. So that first bullet there, they can coordinate homeostatic activities, the endocrine and nervous systems. So help with regulating things like blood pressure, your fluid balance, your hunger, and your thirst. Not that I'm going to ask you to know this for the exam, but I thought it's kind of interesting. Um, CBOs are also thought to be the sites of entry into the brain of the HIV, that awful virus that is um, something hopefully nobody ever has to um, deal with. Uh, but that can come into the brain, at least that's what they think, uh, and that can lead to dementia and other neurological disorders. Like I said, as far as the image goes, you don't need to be able to identify all those little parts and whatnot. Um, so we'll just move on to the cerebrum. Big dog of the brain, the most complex, most structurally and functionally, in my opinion.
All right, cerebrum can be described as the seat of intelligence, and that's because it provides us with the most high level brain functioning. And I always tell students think of this as what separates us from other animals because we have such a large and defined cerebrum. It provides us with things like the ability to read, to write, to speak, make calculations and compose music, remember the past, plan for the future, imagine things that have never existed before. All the things that like animals, you know, I always think about like my dogs, they don't do because um, they're not composing music, thinking about the future, reading, writing, that kind of stuff. Dogs are very smart animals and a lot of other animals are very smart, but they are not nearly what we are. Um, it is the largest and by far and away the largest part of our brain, 80%. It's the uppermost division as well. Um, just like the cerebellum that we talked about just a little bit ago, it consists of two halves and those are the right and left cerebral hemispheres. Surface of the cerebrum is called the cerebral cortex. That's really where all the fun stuff takes place, even though it is only two to four millimeters thick. And uh, therefore, it's not a lot of the cerebrum, but just a very thin shell on the outside. We can see it down here. And we'll talk more about the cortex on the next slide. Um, it is, once again, the gray matter of the cerebrum. And when you talk about or hear the term cortex of the brain, that's probably what is being described, not the cerebellar, but the cerebral, okay? Now, we talked about the cerebellum and how it, it has those folds to increase its surface area. There are special names to the folds and the little depressions that are found within the cerebrum to increase its surface area, okay? We call the folds or the rolls, whatever you wanna call them, gyri or convolutions. Now the word gyri is plural down here at the bottom where we've labeled one of them, it's labeled as a gyrus, which is singular. Okay, so all the folds are gyri. I think of those like little hills. Each of the little depressions, so think of those like little valleys, those are called sulci. Well, as you can see here, it's labeled sulcus, just like gyrus, sulcus is singular. And uh, so we've got gyri, Increase in the surface area greatly. Deep grooves and shallower grooves are also present. The shallow grooves are the sulci. The deeper grooves are known as fissures. Um, the fissures like this one here are much deeper than the sulci. Here's a good example where you can see what we call the longitudinal fissure, which is the one that runs between the two hemispheres. Very deep. That's where you find that Fox cerebri we talked about on Tuesday. The shallower grooves are the sulci. Okay. Um, as it says up here, several prominent fissures in sulci exist, one of which is that longitudinal fissure I just mentioned. Um, there's like the central sulcus, so we'll talk about that here in just a second. As you can see here in our different images, just like what we saw with the thalamus, it's color coded um, to denote the different, what we call lobes of our hemispheres. In the kind of pink shaded color here, it's showing you one of the two frontal lobes. Remember, there are two because there's two halves. We can only see half here, but over here in our top view, we can see both the frontal lobes. Very, very big lobes deep to the frontal bones. Uh, then you got the two parietal lobes shown here was that kind of a purplish blue color deep to the parietal bones. And the back of your brain is where the occipital lobes would be. And then on the sides of your brain, deep to the temporal bones will be your temporal lobes, okay? There is a fifth part to the cerebrum. We call that the insula, okay? And keep in mind, it cannot be seen at the surface of the brain because it lies within the lateral supersulcus, deep to the parietal frontal and temporal lobes, okay? In other words, it's kind of like that image we saw the other day where they were showing us the different ventricles. They've kind of shown where it would be located but this is a superficial view, so you can't truly see it unless you take the brain apart. So as it says in parentheses, it's projected to surface. So you can kind of see and appreciate where it would be located at. Okay. Let's talk about those prominent cerebral fissures and sulci. Um, I've already mentioned the longitudinal fissure. That's what divides the cerebrum into its two cerebral hemispheres. Once again, that's where the Fox cerebri would be located. The central sulcus, is this one here that divides the frontal and the parietal lobes. 
Um, just anterior to it is a very important part of the cerebrum. In the frontal lobe, we call that the precentral gyrus. We'll talk a little bit more about that on the next page. And just posterior to it is what we call the postcentral gyrus. We all know pre and post mean before and after. So pre central gyrus is before the central sulcus, post central comes after it. Okay. The lateral cerebral sulcus, I already mentioned above, is this depression here that helps separate the temporal lobe below and the frontal and parietal lobes above. So it's this depression where you can see it's changing colors from pink to kind of this, I don't know, reddish color. And then the parieto-occipital sulcus is this one here that divides exactly what its name implies, the parietal and occipital lobes from one another. Okay. Here's a view of that transverse fissure that I mentioned earlier and that separates the cerebellum from the cerebrum. And uh, you can see it nicely there. As far as the images go, I would put a big fat star on all of it because they're all very important and uh, all would be fair game. All right, so that's just kind of the anatomy of the cerebrum as a whole. What we're going to do now is talk about the cerebral cortex and what we call its functional areas. These are, like I said, kind of the most drastic complex things that our cerebrum does. So I'll just kind of read through. Specific types of sensory, motor, and integrated signals are processed in certain regions of the cerebral cortex. Generally, sensory areas of the cortex receive sensory info. So in other words, this is where like sensory information, like when you're itchy or when you're tickled, that's where those are going. And they're involved with perception, which we learned uh, previously is the conscious awareness of a sensation. Okay, so like being consciously aware when you're hot or when you walked into this classroom and it was cold or when you're itchy or when you're hot, you're mentally aware of those things. That's what perception is. And you can thank specific parts of your cerebral cortex for it. Okay. Motor areas are um, going to control the execution of voluntary movements. So this is where signals arise for, you know, taking your notes and contracting the muscles in your forearm or getting up and walking out of the room by contracting the muscles in your legs. Association areas are going to deal with more complex integrated functions, things like your memory, your emotions, your reasoning, will, judgment, your personality, and your intelligence. What I've done is kind of picked out, I don't know, like 10 or different, uh, 10 or so different functional areas. There are a lot more. Some of them you can see labeled here. I'm not going to worry about you having to identify this image or anything like that, but this is a mapping showing you some of those very important functional areas. Let's talk about them. The primary somatosensory area is where senses from our skin, muscles, tendons, and joints are processed. Okay? And that is found in that postcentral gyrus that I was pointing out on the previous page, the area behind that central sulcus. So all sensory signals from your skin, from your muscles, your tendons, your joints are going here. So when you're itchy, when you're hot, when your muscles are tired or achy, those signals are going to this big area in your parietal lobes. In front of that central sulcus is the pre-central gyrus, and we call that the primary motor area, or primary motor cortex, and it is shaded red here, and this is what controls voluntary contractions of specific muscles or groups of muscles. So in other words, when you contract your skeletal muscles to write, to walk, to run, to jump, to throw balls, whatever, those signals are originating up here in this primary motor area. And if this is a right hemisphere, as you can see, it's labeled as signals from here would be coming across, thanks to those pyramids in our medulla, to control the left side of the body. Remember, we talked about the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body and vice versa. Okay. So those are why I listed back here on the previous page the precentral and the postcentral gyrus, just because those are so very, very important and so big. The primary visual area or primary visual cortex receives visual information and is involved with visual perception. So you're using this right now to process what you're seeing. We find our visual area in the occipital lobes, mainly on the medial surface next to the longitudinal fissure. Okay, so that's kind of this dark green shaded area. You can kind of think of the, the phrase or the old saying, I have eyes in the back of my head. You truly don't, obviously, but you process what you see in the back of your brain, which is kind of cool. 
Uh, primary auditory area is involved with uh, receiving information for sound and is involved with auditory perception. So in other words, understanding and hearing the words that I'm saying right now, um, you're using that. It is located in the superior part of the temporal lobe near the lateral cerebral sulcus. Primary gestatory area is involved with gestation. Gestation is a fancy word for taste. So when you eat and you taste things, you're using the primary gestatory area to, you know, to process and understand if you like it or no. Located at the base of the post gyrus. The primary olfactory area, olfactory or olfaction is a fancy word for smell. So this is where the senses for smell are being processed. Found in the temporal lobe on the medial aspects. Already talked about the primary motor area. Let's talk about a couple special ones. Wernicke's area is uh, going to interpret the meaning of speech by recognizing spoken words. So in other words, it's what enables you to understand exactly what I'm saying right now. It's found in a broad region in the left temporal and parietal lobes. Um, and then the Brokaw speech area is involved with the articulation of speech. So um, Wernicke's area enables you to understand words that people say. Brokaw speech area enables you to like speak words. Okay? Um, it's located in the frontal lobe close to the lateral cerebral sulcus. And in about 97% of people, it's found in the left hemisphere, which is why, you know, like if somebody, um, has a stroke and it's in that left hemisphere, there are times where like they can't speak. You know, they're just like muttering words, like muttering phrases that don't make any sense. And then one of my favorite areas to talk about is this just big old area in your frontal lobe, what we call the prefrontal cortex. And I really always kind of emphasize that because it's what really keeps us from being all the same, okay? It's where our individuality comes from. It's your personality, it's your intellect, your complex learning abilities, the ability to recall information, your initiative, there should be common there, judgment, foresight, reasoning, your conscience, your intuition, your mood, ability to plan for the future, develop abstract ideas. So obviously a, a very, very important thing. And that's you know pretty evident. You can see how much of the brain is dedicated to your prefrontal cortex. Unfortunately, due to its location, um, it's fairly easy to damage. You think about like car accidents, a common issue with people have when they have a car accident is they hit their head at, like on the dash or on the steering wheel. And, uh, you know, that's where that frontal lobe is. If you hit your forehead, you're going to have a chance to, to have a TBI, a, a traumatic brain injury to the prefrontal cortex. And I remember when I was taking the psychology, they talked about like people that have damaged their prefrontal cortex. They can truly change the person and their personality can be completely different after that issue so all right as far as the image goes like i said you don't need to be able to identify all those different parts and like i said there's a lot more i just kind of picked out some that i thought thought were really, really important all right now that was once again just the very thin outer shell of the brain and that was once again gray matter Let's talk about what's underneath of that gray matter. And that is white matter. Okay. So beneath the cerebral cortex lies the interior of the cerebrum composed mostly of white matter made up of numerous tracts or myelinated axons, which are gonna connect the cerebral hemispheres, connect gyra within the same hemisphere uh, or connect the cerebrum to the spinal cord. Okay. And these tracts are grouped into three types. And they're color coded here in our satchel section and in our frontal section. Here is a nice view where they've removed the gray matter to show them off. They're, think of them like little highways that enable signals to travel throughout the brain or up and down or from front to back within the brain. Okay. So, first, let's talk about projection tracks. Projection tracks are just basically a continuation of the tracks that are down in the spinal cord, they go up and down just like the ones in the spinal cord. So think of these like an elevator. Um, so they extend vertically between higher and lower brain and spinal cord centers, carrying information between the cerebrum and the rest of the body. Here we can actually see where those projection tracks decussate or crisscross in the pyramids of the medulla. We talked about that the other day. Commissural tracks, you can see, are gonna connect the two halves of the cerebrum. So they cross from one cerebral hemisphere to the other. Um, and they form a structure, and this is one of the things I labeled on that first page, called the corpus callosum. Okay, um, that least this is the major one. There's also two other commissural tracts, anterior and posterior commissures. Uh, 
Uh, but the corpus callosum is the big one. Um, if you've ever heard of a lobotomy, that procedure was kind of commonly done a long time ago when they didn't really understand things, where they um, actually would cut the corpus callosum and cut that connection between the, the two halves of the brain and thus um, would drastically affect that person's um, brain functioning. Um, I love the fact that it's corpus callosum, not corpus Christi, despite what I've had students accidentally label on the exam. Um, corpus and callosum both begin with the letter C, so does commissural. And if you kind of turn this page sideways, or you know, if I go back to this picture here, you turn it sideways, what's that letter look like? C. Okay, so there's a kind of handy dandy, easy way to remember it. And you can see it real nicely there as well. And then finally, we have association tracks. Those are the ones here in kind of red. Those are just going to connect different regions within the same cerebral hemisphere. So in other words, it enables signals to go from like the front of the vein to the back of the brain. As far as the images, I do actually want you to highlight a couple of things in these two images here. Um, the two things that are bolded here, association projection tracks. I also want you to highlight the corpus callosum. And then over here, corpus callosum again projection tracks and conventional tracks. Pretty cool to see the real deal here, but not something to ask you to know for the exam. Oh, here's that picture I was looking for the other day. So here is an illustration of what a normal brain would look like. Here's that corpus callosum, where you get that very pronounced white coloring. You can see the, the kind of shaded grayish area. This is the cortex that we were just talking about, where that corpus callosum is nicely connected. Here are those two lateral ventricles I was talking about. This is what a person with CTE looks like. How drastic. Your brain, I think somebody said it looks like mush, and it really does. I mean, crazy, crazy, crazy. I think, if I remember correctly, CTE is chronic traumatic encephalopathy, if I remember correctly. Basically, brain damaged. And uh, common in athletes that are bashing their heads, so obviously football players, but also like boxers, and MMA fighters, and that kind of stuff. Really, really bad deal. I knew I had that picture somewhere. I just couldn't remember where it was at. All right, let's talk about the basal nuclei. It used to be kind of referred to more as basal ganglia, which is misleading as heck, because ganglia is technically supposed to be stuff outside the central nervous system. Basal nuclei makes a lot more sense because um, it's within the brain, and that's obviously within the central nervous system. Um, but the basal nuclei are three nuclei, which are masses of gray matter deep um, within the cerebral hemispheres. Um, and those are the globus pallidus, the putamen, and the caudate nucleus. Okay, and you can see those are labeled here, basically at the, the innermost parts of the brain, which you know we're looking here, basically what we were just looking at here where the, the front of the brain has been cut away. Those structures uh, include, once again, globus pallidus, putamen, and caudate nucleus. The pallidus and the putamen are two basal nuclei just lateral to the thalamus. Here we can see that thalamus labeled as such. Uh, together, uh, they are, there's only supposed to be one there, so you could cross off one of those R's. Those are known as the lentiform nucleus. Okay. Caudate nucleus is a large head connected to a smaller tail by a long comma-shaped body. Okay. And you can see those different parts are labeled here in blue. We've got the head, the body, and then the comma-shaped tail. Um, together, lentiform and the caudate nuclei are known as the corpus striatum. We'll actually kind of see that on the next page a little bit better than we do here. Major function, this is really kind of the major takeaway of your basal nuclei is to regulate the initiation and termination of movement. So in other words, it helps you start and stop moving. Okay? The pallidus also helps regulate muscle tone required for specific body movements. And um, the basal nuclei also are going to be involved with subconscious control of skeletal muscles. Okay. Um, basal nuclei are also going to initiate and terminate some cognitive process such as attention, memory, and planning, and uh, may interact with other components of the brain called the limbic system to help regulate emotional behaviors. As far as the pictures go, I'm not really worried about you identifying them. Um, it's uh, kind of cool to see these things, but I'm just worried about you kind of knowing the information. 
And kind of the same thing, I'm not really going to get too, too specific and in the weeds about, you know, knowing all the specific names. Definitely make sure you know, you know, what the three parts of the basal nuclei are, and then definitely know these last two bullets, what they do. Sound good? Okay, let's talk about that limbic system that I've referred to a few different times. Another part of our brain that has a nickname, we call our emotional brain. It is a ring of structures on the inner border of the cerebrum and the floor of the diencephalon. So we're really kind of in the middle parts of the brain here. We can see a couple of things we've talked about previously. Um, here's that corpus callosum. You can see all the stuff here in green is a component of the limbic system. Um, includes that structure I labeled earlier um, in the lecture on that first page, surrounding or kind of like the big spoon around the corpus callosum, which is a cingulate gyrus. Some different things that we've talked about today, like I mentioned, that mammillary body of the hypothalamus. Um, different parts of the thalamus are visible, like the anterior nucleus. Um, so it's just a collection of things that help us with our emotions or give us our emotions. Okay? Um, this includes that cingulate gyrus, and um, as I've already mentioned, it lies above the corpus callosum. It is going to regulate emotions and pain. Is it also involved with predicting and avoiding negative consequences? So in other words, if you choose not to uh, study for your test, you're ignoring information from your cingulate gyrus because the negative consequence would be doing poorly on this test. Hippocampus is something I mentioned earlier, a uh, portion of what we call the parahippocampal gyrus, extends into the floor of the lateral ventricle, is involved with memory, very important memory structure of our brain is the hippocampus. The dentate gyrus is gonna lie between the hippocampus and the parahippocampal gyrus. The amygdala uh, is composed of several groups of neurons located close to the tail of the cardiac nucleus. It's involved with fear and discriminating objects necessary for human survival. They say that people that have damage to their amygdala are never afraid of anything. And uh, that's really bad. Uh, fear is a good thing. Fear keeps you from doing stupid things or getting hurt or killing yourself. Mammillary bodies, as we mentioned earlier, parts of the hypothalamus located close to midline near the cerebral peduncles are the major relay stations for reflexes related to this smell. The anterior medial nucleus of the Thalamus are involved, olfactory bulbs, which are part of the olfactory pathway. The final structures include the fornix, the strite, terminales, the medullaris, the medial forebrain bundle, mammalothalamic tract, which are linked together by uh, inter interconnecting myelinated axons. Aside from describing it as the emotional brain, I always tell students, think of this like your, your, your basic or your, your uh, primitive brain. Okay, It's what really truly is more what guides lower level animals or you know you think about like we're cave people back before we built civilizations and that kind of stuff and i say that because think about you know like the life of a dog their life is pretty much governed in a few different pretty simplistic ways naps belly rubs and treats right they're not planning for the future and stuff like that i've already talked about that we do they're basing everything around being satisfied emotionally Obviously, we make decisions based on our emotions and we do different things in our lives based on those, but we do a lot more than just take naps and have our bed and have snacks. All wonderful things, but not what really, truly, hopefully anyway, guide us. Um, your emotional brain, as I already mentioned, is involved not only with those emotions like pain, docility, affection, fear, and anger, but also with, its, with smell, olfaction, and memory. Now, this image is something I do want you to highlight some stuff in, and uh, I'll go through and tell you what those things are now. I'll start on the left side here with the fornix, the hippocampus, the dentate gyrus, over on the right side, even though it's not part of it, I do want you to highlight the corpus callosum since it's visible. The cingulate gyrus, 
mammillary body, olfactory bulb, amygdala, and the parrot hippocampal gyrus. All right, and then that just wraps us up. Everything has been talked about as far as the principal parts of the brain. Table 14.2 just kind of breaks them down individually through the, the three parts of the brain stem. Then you got the cerebellum, and then you got the diencephalon and those three major parts, and then the cerebrum that we finished talking about. So include it, it's in your textbook, but uh, I'm not gonna really spend any time talking about it. Last thing we're gonna do is look at the cranial nerves. Since they are so closely associated with the brain, they're connected to it. Talked about them before, at least a little bit here and there. Cranial nerves are nerves of the peripheral nervous system originating from or terminating in the brain. There are 12 pairs of them, so there are 24 total. They have both a name and a number. And you can see them listed down here in the table with both their name and then in parentheses, the new number, which is a Roman numeral. We, we name them, or excuse me, we number them based on their position from anterior to posterior as they attach to the brain. So in other words, olfactory cranial nerves number one, those are the anterior most, okay? And then that means everyone from there goes farther back. And then pair number 12, which is the hypoglossal, those are the very farthest part of the, the back of the brain as far as compared to the others. Uh, now, unlike our spinal nerves, which are always made up of both sensory and motor neurons, so they're like a two-lane highway, not all cranial nerves are that way, okay? As you can see, some of them are mixed nerves containing both sensory and motor neurons, but we also have some that are sensory and some that are motor. Those that are sensory, are predominantly made up of or only contain sensory neurons, which means that they're like a one-way street carrying signals into the brain, like for vision or smell, okay? The very first two that are listed there. Whereas motor, they're like a one-way street, but this, the traffic's going in the opposite direction. Therefore, the signals are leaving the brain and is traveling to places like, you know, to move the eyeballs and uh, contract those muscles that are attached to the eyes. Okay? And that's trigeminal nerve cranial nerves number four. If you look here, I've listed off a really long winded, crazy word or sentence. Doesn't really make much sense, but that's a mnemonic device if that helps you. There's also other ones out there. Um, I think there's one at the bottom of the table too. Yeah, so O, O, O to touch and feel very green vegetables. Ah, not the best, but um, they're just, 12 things that you have to kind of do too. So there's not a good um, mnemonic device in my opinion. But odor of orangutan terrified Tarzan after 40 voracious gorillas viciously attacked him. And uh, as you can see, I bolded all those first letters to uh, represent what the first letter of each of those words is. As far as the table goes, I do actually want you to know it. I'm not gonna um, like get super, super specific, but I do want you to know you know, the names of them, they're Roman numeral, whether they're, excuse me, sensory or mo uh, motor or mixed. And then those principal functions, I promise you, are pretty general. Hey, I mean, some of them, it just says vision or olfaction or hearing equilibrium or, you know, taste or whatever. So um, make sure you, you pay attention to that table. I'm also going to have you identify them, which is what the next couple slides look like here. And uh, this one is from your textbook. And we've actually seen this image several times or at least similar to it. An inferior aspect view of the brain and uh, all those cranial nerves are colored gold. So they really are popping there for you. Um, it's basically just the stuff that's listed there on the left side that I want you to highlight. Now we're gonna talk about uh, some of these nerves a little bit more in our next lecture because what we're gonna start doing is talking about sensations um, like smell and taste and hearing. And uh, some of these cranial nerves, like the very first one there, olfactory nerve number one, is uh, the nerve that carries signals into our brain for the sense of smell. Okay. Go and actually highlight the olfactory bulb that's labeled here. It's just like the fat part of that olfactory nerve. Um, and 
we'll kind of talk more about that. We'll talk about like the um, the point where the two optic nerves, these nerves, keep in mind what you're seeing here for these nerves is basically like the stump of some of them, a lot, a lot of them, for example, like the, the vagus nerves there, cranial nerves number 10, those nerves are not short like what you see there. Those nerves actually vagus means wandering. Those travel all the way from your brain down into your, your abdomen. So they go down through your neck, through your chest, all the way through the diaphragm and down below that. Um, and uh, so what you're seeing is just like where they've been cut short. Um, otherwise they'll be, you know, like dangling. So um, like the optic nerves, that's kind of getting into those, those connect to the back of your eyeballs. Um, and uh, they actually crisscross right there in front of the pituitary. And that's kind of cool. And some of that stuff we'll get into in the next lecture. Last figure here is just uh, the um, cadaver version of that. You can see things really nicely. Um, and they've colored them cool just like that. Um, here's that, what I was talking about where those two optic nerves, you can see this is basically like an X. And that's because the optic nerves carry signals in and they crisscross. And that's what chiasm means to cross. So kind of cool, but not something I ask you enough for the exam. Okay, any questions?